Hello and happy Friday. Um, thank you for joining me on another fabulous Fridays Live with Found My Past. I'm Alex Cox. It's been a while since I've seen or spoken to some of you, so it's nice to be back. Um, and thank you to everybody who's already tuning in. I can see we've got a fair few people watching yet. Um, so I hope a few more people will join in imminently. Um, but what are we talking about today? Um, well, a few things. We've got um, a fantastic update to our Catholic Heritage Archive this week with lots of new records from Scotland. Another good week um, for those with Scottish ancestry. We've had many good weeks for those with Scottish ancestry, actually, over the past few months, and I think we will continue to do so going forward. But yeah, we've got um, some wonderful new Scottish Catholic records, which I thought would be a good excuse to take a little look at the history or you know the, the, the lives of our Catholic ancestors. I think it's fair to say for quite a lot of history wouldn't have been that pleasant um so yeah we'll have a little bit i'll have a little look at catholic catholic ancestors catholic records um how to find them and why find my past is such an excellent place to do it won't be too much of a, 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 a sales pitch i promise um and then i thought depending on how we do for time so after we've looked at this week's, week's records after we've had a little bit of a look at Catholic history and Catholic ancestors. Um, I've been thoroughly enjoying doing some newspaper research recently, which I always love doing, because there's an anniversary coming up this Sunday. And um, I was able to find some really amazing first-hand accounts related to, the, to, to this anniversary. And it just reminded me of the incredible power of newspapers to give you essentially unfiltered access to history. And that's what I love about them so much. You're not, you're not getting this information from a historian or a history book in that you know someone else hasn't taken original source material put their own spin on it and feeding it to you you're going literally straight to the horse's mouth you're you're finding out about events as they happened um from from the time they happened which yeah so that's why we love newspapers we, we know we love newspapers um so yeah th thank take a look at the comments thank you to everybody cheering tuning in you can see hello beth hello M michelle hello ian hello william uh, hello, Roxanne. Hello, Anya. Hello, Diane. Hello, Karen. Hello, Lynn. Hello, Linda. Hello, Angela. Angela. Hello, Joan. Hello, Linda. Hello, Joy. I could go on. I could go on. Uh, it's lovely to see you all. Yeah, it's pretty wet and gloomy here in Twickenham as well. I can feel a few. I can see see a few people in the UK saying grey and wind, grey, wet and windy day. Great excuse to stay inside and do some family history research or listen to me waffle for the next hour. Uh, I can also see a few people watching from more exotic sunny climes. Joan Matalon in Jamaica. Slightly jealous, Joan. Well, less than slight, more than slightly. Very jealous. Linda in Oklahoma. Ellen in Illinois. Um, lovely to have you here. Um, so if you're tuning in for the first time, which I'm sure many of you are not, uh, if you are, welcome. Um, we do these every single week. It's an opportunity for us to tell you a little bit about what we've been working on, what's new at Far My Past, what we're excited about, any discoveries we've made, but also just a chance to have a chat with you uh, and for you to chat to each other. So if you are new, if you've got any queries about family history whatsoever, if you're just starting out, if you're wondering where to find someone, pop it in the comments. If I catch it, I will certainly read it out and see if I can answer it off the cuff if not we've got ellie manning the comments i can see miko is also in the comments so if you've got any questions about scottish research there's uh, you've got a bit of an authority sitting in on this broadcast i'm sure he could answer some of your questions um and also there are some incredibly knowledgeable people watching as well and one of the things we love about these broadcasts is how you all help each other out so yeah i'm sure uh, just to repeat if you've got a question if there's anything you want to know if you're struggling with anything Pop it in the comments, and I'm sure someone will come to your aid. Um, a bit of background as well, if you're watching this for the first time. One of the things I we, we always like to do as well is just to just to get the conversation going, get a bit of a dialogue going, is to start off with a question of the week. Um, and this week's question of the week is, and there's a reason for this. So um, we've been hosting our inaugural community week uh, on Find My Past on blog and social media over the past week, which was an opportunity for us to celebrate all you wonderful people, members of our Find My Past community. Um, we've seen our community go from strength to strength over the past year. It's been really wonderful to see. Um, we rely very heavily on your support, not just in giving us feedback and helping us improve as a website, um, but also all the amazing advice and wonder, 
and help you offer to other users. It's a really lovely sense of community and it's always so great to see. So this week we've been celebrating you all. Um, so with, with community heroes in mind, nice general question. I may have asked this one, asked this one before, but I thought it's one that everybody could answer. The question of the week is tell us about your hero ancestors and why you admire them. It could be for any reason. They could have done something daring. They could have just been incredibly resilient. Is there any, uh, and actually the reason I, I sometimes we ask these questions is because we're always discovering new things. Uh, I think I probably asked this months and months and months ago. And since we last spoke, you may have discovered a new hero ancestor who you've become incredibly interested in. And, and have been exploring the lives. So yeah, tell us about your hi hi hero ancestors and why you admire them. And just to help me spot them, if you could start your answer with um, the, <laughs> the 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 initials that I've actually misspelt. So just put Q uh, Q O T W, uh, and then your answer. I will keep an eye out for them and I will read some of them out because we love hearing about each other's ancestors. What's the point of doing family history if you can't have a little bit of a boast? Um, question of the week already, Beth Whit Whitney said, I've got a couple of them in my family. Um, my grandpa was a Japanese prisoner of war and he showed me tolerance. It's, it's a lovely thing to show as well. My granddad managed to smuggle a banana off the Liverpool Ducks for his, Liverpool docks for his granddaughter, my mum, which I believe was quite a rare commodity just after the first, Second World War. I think there's that famous footage, isn't there, of a little girl trying to eat a banana because she's never seen one before. She has no idea what to do. Uh, he was a marine engineer and he worked with ships during World War II. Thank you very much for sharing that, Beth. Um, and you said already snooping through these Scottish Catholic records. So yeah, I, in the interest of time, I will, I will. <laughs> thank you, Linda. Say he does such a great waffle. Thank you. I, I try my best. Um, actually cook a mean waffle as well. Um, so yeah, that is question of the week. Get them in and tell us about your hero ancestors and why you admire them. Well, so on the subject of heroes, going back to community heroes, um, as I referenced before, we've been hosting our community week launched to recognize and celebrate you all, our lovely, friendly, knowledgeable online followers. Um, yeah, we 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 we're very pleased to have you. Your your passion for the past is incredibly powerful, and day in, day out, you connect with us and each other, which has been really really great to see, especially during the past year where times have been a little tough. Um, but you wouldn't have guessed that with our community. Um, in fact, it's thrived. You've 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 helped when lockdown was first announced. I think our forum doubled in the amount of people who were members on it, which which shows that people want to stay in touch and people want to chat. Um, and I think over the past 12 months, our, our community has been steadily growing. I think we've had a 30% increase in the number of new members. So to all of you who are recent joiners, thank you very much for joining. We're very glad to have you. But yeah, what, what are we doing for Community Week? Well, we posted a few blogs up. Um, there was a brick walls from our community post that was investigated by our customer support team. I think Ali will pop a link to that in the comments if you want to have a little peruse. Uh, we also did a well, one I thoroughly enjoyed reading, was which was an intro to our wonderful customer support team who li relived their proudest moments. I believe some of them actually joined Ellie uh, on a broadcast on when Tuesday or Wednesday to chat about the very important work they do. We're very proud of our customer support team. We like we like to think it shows we really care about your research and your experiences using the site. Uh, but we've also been giving out some daily giveaways, um, and I'll race through these. Um, I'm not sure if any of you guys are watching. If not, you will be contacted. I don't know what I'm saying because you're not watching, but those who aren't watching will be contacted anyway with their prize. So the winner of our military bundle on Facebook was Michael Neal. The US bundle on Facebook was Laurie Ann Conn. The history hit bundle was Liz Harris. Overseas bundle, um, Martina Piper-Smith. Consultation with the winner of the consultation with Vanessa Bland was Barbara. The consultation with Teresa Lynch was Trace Ann. Uh, the puzzler bunder was Lindsay Henderson. So many prizes. So well, I'm, I've still got more to get through. Um, the winner of our Irish Family History Centre tickets and Epic tickets. I had the pleasure of visiting that a few years ago, not long after it opened. It's amazing. Karen Hall, you're very lucky. You won. It will not disappoint. Copy of The Lady in the Cellar on Twitter was Patricia Clues. A copy of History Maker, also on Twitter, was Elizabeth Benson. And a copy of A Curious History of Sex uh, was Kelly Hurst. And last, but by no means least, a copy of A History of the Provincial Press was Catherine. 
Um, well done to all of you. You will be receiving your prizes in due time and we will be reaching out to you directly. There's still actually time to enter the final giveaway, which is a three month pro subscription to Find My Past and a DNA kit. How good is that? Not just a three month pro, pro sub, but a DNA kit, along with a goodies bag where you get your very own Find My Past hooded sweatshirt. I can promise you we've all got one. They're incredibly cozy mug and a coaster and this ends at 9 a.m tomorrow uk time uh, it's on facebook so if you want to win some of that fantastic prize bundle enter uh, and there'll be more giveaways over the weekend so keep your eyes peeled um quick peek at the comments um william shaw question of the week it's really hard to choose this because there are so many different ways of interpreting heroes i agree completely um, but for me, I'd go for my great grandmother, as whilst my great grandfather became ill and took to drink, my granddad's elder sibling had to make sure money got safely home to Hampshire when he was in the Far East. My great grandmother made sure, sorry, I didn't even bring it up on screen. Uh, my great grandmother made sure that the children were all looked after and even got them involved in seeing their other aunts and uncles who were not related to her, but through my grandmother, I suspect that is. Well, thank you for sharing that. William, and do you know what? Um, I'm going to be joined by a special guest in a second. You're getting two for the price of one. Um, we have all, we all also got another important award to announce, which is the winner of our community award. And I'm going to let Ellie, who should be joining me at any moment, tell you a little bit more about that and, and really and reveal the happy news. Hello, Ellie. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy Friday, Alex. Hope you're all really well. How are you doing, Alex? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Always always enjoy being on here. I know, me too. Um, I might, this is gonna be interesting because I'm multitasking in the comments at the same time. Um, but um, everybody at home, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, Alex uh, really, really kindly let me hop in today just to announce the winner of our very first community award. Um, we don't like to brag, but we think you guys are amazing um every day we see you know you helping each other out and i get goosebumps just talking about how incredible you guys are um so we wanted to give uh, you the chance to say thank you to somebody who's helped you with your research with your brick walls etc so there's a big prize bundle up for grabs it's worth over 450 pounds altogether and earlier this week we asked all of you to nominate your family history here over on our blog we asked an independent judge, um, house historian and a house through time researcher, Melanie Back Hansen, to shortlist five finalists. And then it went back to you to vote. And the voting closed about an hour ago. So now I'm really, really, really pleased to announce the winner of our very first community award. Really, really exciting. Just want to, just a quick reminder of the prize bundle. So the winner will receive a 12 month pro subscription to Find My Pass, Find My Pass DNA kit, an annual family subscription to English Heritage, an annual subscription to Puzzler magazine, an essential photo organizing course by Maureen Taylor, the photo detective, a migration museum gift set, and also Find My Past swag. You get a hoodie, you get a coaster, and a mug. I love these mugs. So yeah, it's, it's time to announce the winner, which is just so, so exciting. Um, this is this feels a bit like X Factor, you know, how long can I drag this out for? <laughs> Let's have a quick look in the comments, see what you guys are saying. Just lots of you saying hi. Well, I think we'll just get it over with. So with 70% of the vote, the winner of our first community award is Anya, congratulations! Yay, well deserved, very well deserved. It is so well deserving and um, we put the nomination from William up on the blog but in fact Anya was nominated not once, not twice, but three times which is just testament to how incredible you are. You know, William said that, you know, the amount of times that you have helped them out and you're always willing to chat and you're, you're, you're a regular here on Find My Pass From Home as well. So it's just wonderful. You're wonderful and everybody else, you're also wonderful as well. But Anya, you've won this fantastic prize. Um, please drop me an email um, and we can start arranging getting your prizes sent out. Yeah, congratulations. congratulations. This is some, this is some great prizes. Well, and congratulations to everybody else who was nominated as well. 
Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's a lovely testament of how all won- how wonderful you've all been over the past what, the past year. So yeah, congratulations on you. That's brilliant. Yeah. So that's me. I will hop out now, but I will still be in the comments. So please, uh, please chat. Oh, Ellie, me. before you go, before yeah. you go, I'm just about to move on to records. Mm. Um, and one of the as part of Community Week, we've been allowing people to vote for what new records they'd like to see added on the site. And one of the record collections I'm going to be talking about in a second is is the first of those sets that have been voted for by the community. How, um, if people want to vote for next week's, how do they go about doing it? Yeah, so if you head over into the What's New section of our blog on Farmer Past, uh, you can scroll down and you can vote for one of three options that you would like to see released next week. So we listened to you last week, you voted, it got released this week, and we're doing the same again. We've got some more record sets for you to vote on. So head over there and vote. Brilliant. Well, thanks, Ellie. Okay, take care. I'm going to hop out now. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Oh you back on <laughs> uh yeah lots of congratulations uh from viewers there i can also see that this week's question of the week's been rather popular which i'm pleased about i thought it was a good one so i'm going to read out a few more before i really must move on to records because time does march on so um janet talk 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 reveal i think is has said question of the week my heroic ancestor has to be my grandmother as a married woman with three young children she joined thousands of East Enders to help prevent Mosley and the British Union of Fascists marching through the Jewish East End. Yeah, that's a great one. That's a, wow, that's a, his, a historic moment for your, aunt, for, for your um, grandmother to witness and also play a very noble part in it as well. Um, Joan Matalon said, um, my great grandmother left my great grandfather and went to the United States with her children, except my grandmother because she was married to my grandfather. Uh, the reason my grandfather was the re- reason was my grandfather was an alcoholic. He later committed suicide. That's very tragic, but very intrepid of your great grandmother. Um, you, you know, emigrating and starting a new life, the consequences of which I'm sure you're enjoying today. Um, have a look at a few others. Linda Kirk has said, "Question of the week: Granddad Harry lived on his dad's farm. One of eleven kids. Whoa." Went off to war in World War One with his four brothers, all different regiments. But all, all five came home safe. Wow, that's 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 amazing. Quite lucky as well. Joined the London Fire Brigade and served in the Blitz. He retired in 1955. Yeah, that's 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 pretty heroic. That's quite a heroic life. Not not one war, but two. Um, have a look at one more before we move on to records. Um, Janet Sutton said, my grandfather, he was a pre-war soldier, 1906 in 1913, recalled to the colours in August 1914, captured in October and survived the hardship for four years as a POW in Germany. That is a long time. Repatriated January 1919. I wish I had known him better. I was only four when he died. And, wow. And I, I wonder, Janet, did you, have you found much about him in our collection of prisoners of war records? Because that does cover both not only the First and the Second World War, but I think it goes all the way back to the War of 1812, perhaps even before. And you can, it covers a lot of um, camps in Germany or run, run by the Germans during the First World War. Uh, one more, one more, I can't resist. Um, Kath Rhodes says, my four times great-grandfather who left Ireland with nothing. Each generation worked hard to improve their lives. He was a saddler. His son started off as a miner, but became a mining engineer. His son built up a business which passed to my granddad, allowed my dad to be a teacher. I made it to university and became a pharmacist. So from simple roots, I made it as a health professional. That's, yeah, that's a lovely one. A great example of how, you know, families, fortunes can reverse through the generations. And many of us do benefit from the incredibly the incredible hard work and sacrifices that were made by our ancestors many many generations ago i love that yeah left ireland from leaving ireland with nothing to to becoming a, a health professional that's wonderful thank you very much well as it's already 20 past four i think i really well in the uk at least i think i really should start taking a look at this week's new records because they are great ones so as well as the collection that's been voted in by you guys, um, the highlight this week is definitely the fact that we've added over half a million new records to our collection of Roman Catholic sacramental r- registers from Scotland. This forms part of our wider Catholic heritage archive, something we launched back in, I think we might have launched 
quite a few years back now. I think it might have been 2016. Uh, and this marks just the latest update to the Catholic Heritage Archive, which is largely exclusive to Find My Past. This was a groundbreaking initiative, um, or if I do say so myself, on our part, to basically start digitizing the millions of Catholic records that were had remained locked away for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, the Catholic Church kept some of the will hold some of the most comprehensive and best preserved family history records out there. And until relatively recently, they were very, very hard to come by. Hardly any were online. The only way you could access them was by actually visiting a church and access then would be at discretion of the priest. Um, but thanks to the partnerships we've been able to establish with our wonderful partners, partners in archdiocese, not only in Scotland, but in England, Ireland, and across America, we have been able to bring millions of Catholic records online for the very first time. Um, and yeah, this week's updates are biggie. So in total, it's just under 647,000 baptisms, marriages, burials, and congregational registers that have been added. Um, I'm sure Ellie will post a link to the blog if you want to um, get links to easily access all of them. Oh, I forgot my banner. We're talking about this week's new this week's new records, just so you know what I'm talking about. Um, and where was I talking about the records? <laughs> so these are they're very detail rich as well. I mean, I'll talk a little bit about Catholic records and sacramental registers in a second. But each result that you'll get for these will bring back both a transcript and a scanned image, many of which are in colour, of the original register itself. And always check those images. That's where you'll find a lot of information that isn't listed in the transcript and can really help you paint a fuller, richer, more vivid picture of your ancestors' lives. Um, the amount of you, the, the information that you'll get back may vary, but generally relatively consistent. Um, as I said, very rich. So for baptisms, as well as the kind of, well, all the records will reveal key biographical details. You'll get a sense of when your ancestor was born. Um, you'll also find the date, location and parish in which this, the location that was being recorded took place. Um, uh, but you'll also find loads of additional details, which can be very, very useful if you're building out your Catholic family, family tree. So, for example, baptisms will reveal the names of godparents and parents. Obviously, parents are very, very handy because it allows you to go back a generation. Um, and if you can then use that information to search for registers, sacramental registers further back and repeat the process and just keep it growing your family tree further back into the midst of time. But the names of godparents are also very useful as well. You know, they will often be close relatives. It may provide you with a clue to the identity of a close relative that you didn't know about. If not a relative, they're, they're going to be very close family friends. Um, and if you are interested in getting a full sense of your ancestor's life, it's definitely worth having a look at who their close friends were, the people they trusted enough to um, bestow with a very important title of uh, godparent, which was taken incredibly seriously. Um, you know, historically, probably more seriously than it is today. Um, actually saying that, we've, we've picked godparents for our son and we, we, we spent a lot of time agonising over that. We took that very seriously. Uh, marriages um, obviously will not, will obviously provide you with the name of your ancestor's spouse, allowing you to add a whole new branch to your family tree. Uh, it'll also provide you with the names of the fathers for both the bride and groom. So also useful for tracing your family tree a little bit further back. But again, like godparents, they will also images will often provide you with the name of witnesses. And again, witnesses were either close relatives or very, very fond family friends. So those names can be very handy. Um, so yeah, great records and burials. You know what a burial records? It records a burial, but uh, it'll be able to tell you the final resting place of your. Scottish Catholic ancestors, you will be able to locate the, the church and parish in which they were buried. It'll also tell you their age at death, their marital status, and in some cases, which I always find, maybe it's my more the, my morbid fascination with these things, but it, some records will even provide you with the cause of death, which is not always included in, in parish registers. Um, and finding a cause of death can be quite tricky if you don't find something in the newspapers. So that's a very valuable uh, piece of information to get your hands on. So yeah, these are fantastic records. Uh, in terms of where they come from, the overwhelming majority of these cover the Archdiocese of Glasgow. 
Um, Miko was sending me, because Miko really knows the Scottish records, um, Miko was sending me some notes on this before. Um, one of the interesting things about Glasgow, of course, particularly for those with Catholic roots, uh, it was a real hub for Irish, Polish and Italian immigration, of course, very Catholic countries, very Catholic communities. Um, and in fact, in terms of the Western Scotland, West of Scotland in general, if you had ancestors from the West of Scotland, there is a very good chance that they either went into or moved to Glasgow at some point in their lives. And if they did, some of the vital life events that these records capture may contain the details of your ancestors. So yeah, they're very, very pleased to have these new Scottish um, Catholic records up. The Catholic Heritage Archive will continue to grow. We'll be adding more records to it over time. Um, quick note, actually, one of the things I learned today about our search on the Catholic records, because I don't have that many Catholic ancestors, so I haven't had a chance to use them that much, but was, of course, Latin is the official language of the Catholic Church. Many of these original registers were actually written in Latin. Um, and one of the things we've done is Far My Past have actually applied a Latin dictionary to the name search field. This gives you the ability it gives our search the ability or capability, how you want to describe it, to search for the English and Latin versions of a name, provided that you select the variance option. So that would be my top tip when you're searching these records. Do tick the variance option because the Latin version of your ancestor's name may be in there. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit about Latin and the quirks of Catholic records in a second. But of course, those aren't the only new records we've added to the site this week. Um, the, the collection that has been voted by voted for by you, uh, our new additions to our collection of Yorkshire monumental inscriptions, inscriptions from God's Own County, England's largest county. Really a must search for anyone with Yorkshire roots. I love monumental inscriptions. I love cemeteries. I love graves. I love reading epitaphs. Um, but the reason these records are so valuable is because they can provide you with all kinds of details apart from dates and locations. They can give you the names of additional family members. You may find personal touching tributes that were inscribed at the, at the request of, of their relatives. Uh, you may find details about their occupation. There's all sorts you can find out with monumental inscriptions apart from dates and locations. So yeah, check them out. We've got loads of monumental inscriptions from all over the British Isles on Far My Past. As always, if you want to know exactly what we've got, go to our A to Z, A to Z, A to Z of record search. Pop in the type of records you're looking for, and um, it'll give you a good indication of what we've got up. And last but not least, we've added loads of new newspapers. I won't read out the full list of papers that we've added pages to. We've added additional papers to 11 existing titles. But we have, what I will read out is we've added five brand new ones. So we've added the Ballymena Advertiser, good Irish paper, the Boston Spa News, the reason I find that one quite interesting is because um, Boston Spa is where we digitise our newspapers. More on that in a second. Uh, the Galway Express, another good Irish paper, Isle of Wight Journal, the Western Star and Ballin the Sale Advertiser. Um, if you want more information on that, visit the... Um, visit the what's new section of our blog you'll find a full list of every single newspaper that's been added to the site and a link that will con continually no, sorry easily immediately take you there not continually um but on the subject of boston spa newspapers i know it was touched upon last week when i wasn't here but uh, i'm sure many of you saw the news that we're very very pleased to announce that we've renewed our long-term partnership with the british library which means newspaper digitization at boston spa is going to continue uh, we plan on adding, I believe, around 14, 15 million new pages over the next three or four, two to three years. Uh, so more newspapers are coming. And on that front, Ellie, um, very, Ellie is typically modest, but Ellie has created a fantastic video, which I, she, I don't think she showed you last week, but I wanted to show you. It's only three or four minutes long because it gives you a, a, a great idea of the huge scale and scope uh, of the project to bring these newspapers online. So bear with me, and I'm going to show you, uh, voiced, o voiced, o voiced over by our very own Ellie Overthrow Jones, uh, I'm going to give you a very quick peek behind the scenes at Boston Spa. Watch this. It's amazing. Over 55 million historical newspaper pages are to be made available thanks to exclusive Find My Past and the British Library Partnership. 
42 million newspaper pages are currently searchable on the British Newspaper Archive and Find My Past, with a further 14 million planned by 2023. History's headlines are now just a simple click away. Discover history as it happened by searching billions of lines of text by name, keyword or phrase, all from the comfort of your home. The collection continues to grow at an unprecedented rate, with over 900 newspaper pages being digitised every hour. Browse over 300 years of sensational newspaper headlines with over 22,000 additional pages uploaded daily. Searches performed across this vast cultural treasure have increased by 45% since lockdown restrictions were first announced, suggesting we are a nation who wants to better understand our past. Search for articles on everything from the Napoleonic Wars and the wedding of Victoria and Albert to advertisements for boldness elixirs, old sporting fixtures and political debates. There is something for everyone and whether searching on a personal or historical level, you will find yourself transported straight back to scenes of infamous crimes, social deprivation and church meetings from hundreds of years ago. Explore today at the British Newspaper Archive and find my past. Wasn't that cool? Um, I, I loved seeing that. It shows you how high tech um, some of the processes are that are involved in, in, in preserving these newspapers. They're stored in low oxygen environments. They're retrieved by robotic arms and transported by driverless shuttles to our digitization film, digitization team. It's almost like something out of a Bond film, you know, like a Bond villain's lair. But in, in, instead of doing evil, we're doing great good in uh, preserving these cultural treasures. I think they are cultural treasures. The national memory, you could call it, really. Not only making sure that there's permanent digital versions, which will be available for all time, but also means that anyone can explore them, no matter where they are in the world. Uh, their academic background, access is for all. You just need a subscription. Um, so let's have a, we've loads of more comments coming through, more, more questions of the week. Um, Linda Debbie said, question of the week, that would be my maternal grandmother. She lost both her parents when she was nine years old and then lost two nephews in World War One. Also, her husband was wounded too. He died in 1926, aged just 35. She then lost a daughter aged 19. Yeah, that's a lot of loss to deal with in one life. Um, one from our winner, Anya. Question of the week. Oh, there are heroes for many different reasons. I always go back to find my five times great grandfather, Robert Carey. He was born in Westmeath and signed up to the 42nd Regiment of Foot. We, uh, he was at Corona where he was injured and the whole regiment ended up in Musselburgh Muscle near Edinburgh to recover. That was where he met my five times great grandmother. She ended up traveling with the regiment as a woman, as women did in those days. And Robert was in further action right up until Waterloo. Wow, I can't see the rest of that comment. I would have loved to have carried on reading it because that is a great ancestor and a great story. Um, Great comment from Miko, just to let you all know, Find My Past intends to be the place, not just a good place, the place to go to find all of your Scottish ancestors, no matter their faith, be it, be it Catholic, Episcopal, Free Church or anything else. There are many, many more. Uh, there are more than any more records than anywhere else now, but there are lots more coming very shortly. Yeah, do keep your eyes peeled. Um, Audrey, uh, talking about Catholic records, I was able to visit the Catholic Church, St. Pan St. Patrick's in Anderston, Glasgow, where my grandparents, great-grandparents and other family members married, and where there is a memorial plaque to my great-great-grandfather and other parishioners who were members of the crew of the HMF M. Ermine, sunk by a German U-boat in 1917. Oh, wow, well, Audrey, it sounds like these this week's records could be right up your street, um, being from the Archdiocese of Glasgow. Let us know if you find anything in there. One more comment, I think. Uh, oh, Sylvia. Hello, Sylvia. Lovely to see you. I've had a behind-the-scenes tour at Boston Spa. I'm jealous. I, 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 I've meant to have one for years now, and I haven't got around to it yet. Amazing to see how they look after the material. Yeah, they do. Very, very carefully cared for, and we're very proud to be involved and very pleased that we get to continue this work. So it's already 35 past. I think I should probably start talking about Catholic ancestors, because that's what I said I was going to do. I always like to have a little bit, bit of a look at social history or, or context. You know, what was it like for our ancestors 
Um, what was life like? What were the times they lived through? What, what were the experiences they endured? Um, and I think for quite a lot, for, for, for quite a lot of history, the experiences of our Catholic ancestors was not particularly pr pr pleasant. The history of Catholicism in Britain is fascinating. It's a story of persecution, really, story of hardship, story of struggle. Um, ever since the separation from Rome, which was spearheaded by Thomas Cromwell, you know, of, of Wolf, Horn, Wolf Hall fame, the man we can thank for parish registers, um, things for Catholics in the in the UK weren't particularly great. Cromwell was an interesting guy. I mean, he'd been a relatively unremarkable MP, uh, but then he delivered this supplicate, supplication of the Commons against the Ordinaries, where he argued passionately that if England could become the most powerful, he argued that England become the mo could become the most powerful state in Europe if it shook off the shackles of foreign ecclesiastical courts and became truly independent. Um, and he drove... He was the real driving force behind this separation. People blame it on Henry VIII and his desire for a divorce. It wasn't really. It was Thomas Cromwell who wanted this. Um, he, he, I mean, he drove the separation forward long after Henry VIII had kind of lost a bit of nerve and interest in it, really. Um, but I, I find it very interesting because, uh, as many things, as with many things in history, you can join, you can make parallels to today. Some are obvious, some are less obvious, and you know. Well, normally you don't have to look that hard to spot them but i think you know the, the national rejection of rome in britain clearly defined british catholicism uh, as countercultural um it but i think one of the things we take for granted is that the the rejection of rome and the split from rome was was a big part of the founding of britain's national identity it was what made britain feel separate from Europe, you know, with, a, with their own distinct and you know non-European identity. It was it was this rejection of Catholicism. And, and these parallels, as I said, they're not merely historic. I mean, not getting too much onto politics, but the European Union's ideology is deeply indebted to Catholic social teaching. And even the stars on the EU flag refer to the Blessed Virgin Mary's crown. Um, so yeah, I think, as I said, the story of Catholic Catholicism in the UK, mirror image of the creation of British national identity. For centuries, being Catholic was something that was deemed incredibly negative. Um, not just negative, but negative and traitorous against British Britain itself. Um, I think the Reformation made Britain feel like it could kind of begin the world over again. Um, the separation from Rome was a separation from the infrastructure of worship, welfare, education, power, all things that have been very dominant in British history up to this point. I mean, you, you kind of need to look at the full 500 year timeline of the events following this to get a real sense of how long this kind of reinvention of national identity took. But there was a very high, high price paid for it. Um, and as, 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 as often with, with history and, and carving out states and nationhood, fear was a very powerful tool in doing all this. You know, at times, the fear of Catholicism was, was reasoned. You have the Spanish Armada, the famous gunpowder plot. I mean, I think it shows that we're still living with, with the legacy of some of these events that, you know, on November the 5th around the country, people still burn effigies of a man who was executed for attempting to blow up parliament due to his Catholic faith um, and as a result of the persecution Catholics were facing. Um, there was also the Babbitton plot. That was a plan in 1586 to assassinate Queen, Queen Elizabeth, a Protestant, and put Mary, Queen of Scots, a Roman Catholic cousin on the throne. I think you probably know all this story. It led to Queen Mary's execution. Um, a result of a letter that she sent consenting to the assassination that was was, was captured. Uh, at other times, this fear was largely imagined. You know, you, you had the famous popish plot by Titus Oates, which was a supposed Catholic conspiracy to King Charles, King, to kill King Charles II, and it was completely false. Um, but it was so it was readily believed at the time by people who were willing. Well, for people whom I think you could say truth was less important than power. Um, but I, I do find all this interesting. So, but yeah, being a Catholic was very difficult. Being a Catholic made you a traitor uh, in the eyes of, of most people. There are so many examples of this. You know, in 1581, there was a Jesuit priest, an underground priest who was secretly you know, giving 
communion and Catholic sermons. Many were at the time. Um, he became a martyr to the, to the Catholic Church uh, when he was executed in 1581. And he famously argued during his, his execution that, you know, he said, we're as good subjects as the Queen ever had. And one looker at the hanging just shouts out, in your Catholicism, all treason is contained, which shows the kind of animosity they faced, really. Um, hard to imagine in today's uh, world. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the reign of Elizabeth I, which is celebrated by many as being kind of like a golden era, um, for, for 10 years or so at least, was a real, <laughs> was a real time of terror for Catholics. They, they enjoyed, puni they, they lived under punitive fines, travel bans, the ever-present threat of execution. Um, and then, obviously, a couple, of years, a couple of decades, maybe a century or two later, Oliver Cromwell came to power and things didn't go too well during that period as well. well Cromwell's first public role, actually, was to lead a committee uh, which was set up with the aim purely of ensuring that recusant families, these were families that had refused to attend Anglican church services, um, had no access to weapons, again, playing on this fear that the Catholics are out to get us and they could rise up at any minute. Uh, during his protectorate, um, he, he organised, you know, migrations of Catholics to his plantations in the Caribbean, and obviously famously persecuted Ireland's Catholic population with devastating results, reducing its population by a third. Just let that sink in, a third. Um, yeah, it, it, it was it wasn't wasn't easy. So I think whenever you're whenever you're discovering, and, and I think that legacy went on until much more recently than we probably think. Really, um, you know, the effect of all these incredibly traumatic events and 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 kind of violent rhetoric is long lasting. I mean, it's been a very very long time since people believed Titus Oates's complete lie that the Catholics were trying to assassinate the king. But even until the 20th century, I think being a Catholic in some parts of the country was considered a bit unusual, you know, at least a little bit other. Um, so yeah, my point with that is when you're when you're exploring the lives of your Catholic ancestors, bear that in mind. Have, try and imagine the world they were living in and the struggles they endured. Um, and moving on, if you're going to explore the lives of your Catholic ancestors, how do you do it? Well, sacramental registers, like I've just talked about, are probably one of the best ways of doing it. Um, as I said, in, in the Catholic Heritage Archive, we have a wide variety. We've got a good collection for, of English records from Birmingham, Middlesbrough, Southwark, Westminster, Liverpool. Uh, the Liverpool collection I find particularly interesting, not just because I'm from that neck of the woods, but because it was such a um, migration hub. I mean, between 1830 and 1930, 40 million people left Europe in search of a better life. Um, and roughly 9 million of those 40 million, so pretty much a, four, a quarter of them sailed from Liverpool, which was then the most important emigration port in the world. Uh, these people were traveling to North America, Australia, New Zealand, the new world, essentially. Uh, and there were millions of Irish, English, Scottish, Italians, Germans, Polish, many of whom were Catholics and many of whom got married, died, or about, had children baptized in Liverpool. They are captured by these records. So um, yeah, very, very useful collection if you're tracing immigrant ancestors from Catholic ancestors from Ireland to America or from England to America. Um, as I just mentioned, we've also got a great collection of Scottish Catholic records, which has continued to grow this week. We've also got a fantastic collection of um, Irish Catholic records, over 10 million, covering every county uh, and over a a thousand parishes, so very big, very exhaustive. And if you're serious about doing your Irish family tree and your Irish ancestors are Catholic, you really can't miss that one. Um, and last but not least, we've also got a fantastic collection of American Catholic records. Uh, we've got records from dioceses, including Baltimore, Chicago, Cincinnati, New York, Philadelphia, Toledo. Of course, New York, again, very important immigration hub loads of catholic immigrants flocked into new york and you will find many of them in those records um cincinnati also an interesting one not one to look overlook not one to overlook in 1850 cincinnati was the fifth largest city in the united states 
and its location on the Ohio River basically meant basically meant it's a very popular stopping off point for migrants and pioneers who were traveling on west. Of course, many of these people were Germans, Irish, um, Poles, again Italians, lots of European immigrants. And just as with Liverpool and New York, many of them stopped off here, had children, got married, died, and you will find them in these records. Um, but yeah, sacramental records are effectively parish records. It's very similar to English parish registers. And in type, they you know tend to comp they tend to be made up of baptisms, bans, marriages, and burials, not too dissimilar to what you'd get when you're exploring Anglican parish records. But then there are of course sacramental registers, which give a different, somewhat narrower view of events, but they're I think they're really interesting because they can give you a really nice idea of your ancestors' relationship with the church. You'll find all sorts in, in congregational records. I mean, you'll find things like uh, maybe records of their first communion, their first confession. You may even find the location of the seat they rented in church. If they were particularly avid churchgoers, they were and they rented their own pew. You'll find that in congregational records. Always worth, not, always worth not overlooking congregational records. Um, I mean, you, baptisms are core. They're essential if you're building a family tree. Um, as, as I've already touched on, you'll find many um, family members included in them, whether they're parents, whether they're godparents, close relatives. Um, one thing to note, actually, with Catholic baptisms, actually, is that there is a much higher proportion of adult baptisms i.e converts you would find in anglican records so don't just focus on children uh, you may find people getting baptized much later in life bands are also very useful um, i'm sure most of you know what bands are but if you don't they're declarations of an intention to marry um, not a particularly common feature of catholic record keeping um, as the band is not it's not really a sacrament they're largely administrative they're largely an administrative and legal feature uh, permitting members of the congregation to object if they observed an impediment to the upcoming ma marriage. Um, but yeah, they are included in, in our collections and they're also worth looking at. Marriages, again, don't need to sell you those. Perfect for finding the details of uh, your ancestor's spouse, adding a new um, branch to your family tree. Um, and in, particularly with American, in, to, they're particularly useful in America because they will often give Play, details of place of origin and of both the bride and groom and if those are immigrants that is tr tremendously interesting you know the place of origin overseas is often vital in prosecuting if that's the word you want to say and pursuing a successful search back in the homeland for example whether it be ireland italy lithuania poland slovakia wherever they came from um burials also very 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 useful um allow you to find out where your ancestors were buried, where they spent their last final years. Um, I think one of the things to, one of the main things to bear in mind though, is the use of Latin. Um, it's not, it's not too problematic because as I said, we, we, our search has the Latin dictionary applied. So as, as long as you click name variants, you'll get results for both the English and, and Latin variations of the name. Um, I mean, it can introduce some challenges. If you go to the bottom of a search page of any of our Catholic search pages, you'll find a little bit of a glossary, terms that you can keep an eye out of, like keep, keep an eye out for like deep dimensis, day of the month, philum, filiam, son or daughter, matrimon matrimonium, obviously relating to the sacred sacrament of the holy mat of holy matrimony, um, nomina, parentum, names of parents. Um, but I think the thing you really need to bear it. Bear, bear in mind is um, how Latin applies to proper nouns, four names, basically. Um, so, for example, uh, Jacob may be written as Jacobus, Jacobum or Jacobi. Maria could be Miriam, Marae. Um, so it's worth doing a little bit of um, reading around Latin and the version that was being used. <clears throat> so yeah, we're very proud of our, our Catholic records. We've got many, 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 many of them on site. Um, uh, best way to find out more about them, I think, is just going to our A to Z, A to Z 
typing in Catholic and you will see that there's not just baptisms, marriages, burials, sacramental registers, all that kind of thing. You'll find things like um, oath rolls, um, congregational records, convert rolls, Catholic qualification rolls, diocesan newspapers, Catholic censuses, particularly in places like Westminster, uh, Catholic church directories for Ireland. Um, there's, there's quite a rich variety there, so check it out. I'll have a quick look at some comments um, before we start wrapping up. Um, Lloyd said, many families in Europe were split based on geography. My closest royal was a second cousin, Polish princess, twice and then Duchess, her first marriage nullified by the Pope, but otherwise the family was completely Reformation outside of Poland. Oh, wow, that is interesting. Um, Joan Felt, I think, saying uh, about the records, this is great news, my Church of Scotland. Oh, no, this, I think this is Miko's teaser, all the records that are coming. Uh, my Church of Scotland family disappeared, no hints on my FMP for tree for Muirhead family from uh, 1800 to when they arrived in Australia in 1849, but I'm constantly using your fabulous clues how to research. Learn loads about life in this period. Uh, I always think that's a valuable exercise, getting the context. Yeah, that's um, another reminder of the fact that keep checking. We add new records all the time. Just because you can't find anything now doesn't mean you won't do in a couple of weeks or months or even further down the line. Uh, Diane Mullen said, found my granny and granddad's confirmation records. So happy. But not being raised Catholic, what's the meaning of the confirmation name? I wasn't raised Catholic either, so that is a good question. I think that is the saint's name you're given when you're confirmed into the Catholic Church. I may be wrong. If there are any bona fide Catholics out there wincing at what I'm saying, do correct me. Um, a few people seem to be having a few problems with the video. Sorry about that. Um, uh, Lloyd again saying about the power of newspapers. In newspapers, I was able to find 3,000 articles written by my first cousin once removed. We recently found out she had passed away due to uh, due to an air due to an air finder. Oh wow, that's that's cool. Well, not, it's tragic she was passed away, but it made, uh, interesting that the air finder uh, got in touch to let you know. Uh, lost contact during COVID as we didn't realise her descent into difficulty. Oh, that's sad. Still so nice to have her memories as an early woman reporter in the field of the 1960s and tackling the difficult issues. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, Lloyd, I'd love to read her articles. If you wouldn't mind getting in touch at discoveries at findmypast.com. She sounds awesome. I would, I'd love to read some of her articles and hear her stories. Um, Linda has said, uh, I found loads of info from newspapers, lots of sad stuff, but a few funny ones too. My great grandmother was a witness to a murder. Wow, yeah, and that's the kind of colour and rich detail that you will only find in newspapers. And that leads me nicely on to my final, final point. Of course, um, this Sunday marks the 77th anniversary of the Normandy landings, the largest scale invasion in human history, an incredibly important watershed moment of the Second World War paved the way for the liberation of Western Europe. I know it's not a major anniversary, but I'm, I have a personal interest in D-Day because as I've told you all many, many times, my grandfather was there uh, and I went to Normandy with him to revisit the beaches, which was an amazing experience. Um, but, but as the anniversary was coming up, I obviously, World War II records are quite hard to come by. Ministry of Defence still hold most of them. Um, but there, you know, there are loads of other resources you can use. We've got casualty lists, Commonwealth War Graves lists, prisoner of war records, all these other things you can use to find out more. But newspapers are, there's so much in there. I mean, I was looking for D-Day diaries and first-hand accounts, and some of the ones I found in there are absolutely amazing. There's a blog that's going to be published over the weekend, so keep an eye out for that. Um, but they're fantastic. I mean, it's amazing hearing veterans' recollections you know, seven, 70, 77 years after. But I think it's also amazing to hear these accounts immediately after the events took place. Uh, and that's what I love about newspapers. It re you really are accessing history unfiltered. Um, as I said, I don't want to give too much away because the blog post is going to be coming soon. Um, but yeah, there, there are really, really vivid first-hand accounts in there. I mean, the, the ones I found, my favourite ones were... Um, a Hull Soldier's vivid hour-to-hour -hour diary that was published in the Currymuir Free Pass and District Advertiser, which um, had its last issue in 1960, but this was published 
on the 6th of July 1944, so literally a month after the landings took place. Um, it was They were written by a chap called John Robson, who was a photographer for the Hull Daily Mail. So obviously he had a bit of a journalist, that journalistic spirit, but he kept incredibly detailed diaries, which he sent home. And he had quite a dangerous job. He was one of the advanced parties that had to clear the mines on the beaches and prepare uh, a road through for the troops that were going to follow the advance. Um, and it's vivid, you know, you really get a sense of what it was like being there, you know, you sense the nervousness. So he starts by saying, we're all very quiet as the craft begins to ground. The bows are beginning to lower now. I prepare to jump into the sea. Not yet. The craft did a little waver, nose is nearer and further up the beach, grounds again and then stops. I jump as a, th as a third man f into four feet of sea. Swirling with current, I can see figures lying prone to the earth, firing at us through the smoke of a burning tank, which is a salvation for something which had gone adrift with the smoke screen on our sector of the beach. The RE lads on my left side gave the the RE lad on my left side gave a grunt, goes down, floundering in the sea, swirling around in the current to be drowned, most likely. My fingers just slide over his clothes as I make a grab at him. I was helpless to do anything much for him. Burdened as I was with all the kit, I couldn't even fire my rifle in protect protection. And that's incredibly tragic to read and it echoes my grandfather's experience. I mean, he was incredibly traumatized by the events of the landings. And one of the things that really stuck with him was seeing all these very young lads, you know, 19, 20 year old lads struggling in the water with these heavy packs, drowning. And the whole point of the operation was move, 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 get off the beach, don't clog things up. There's nothing they could do to help them. They just had to move on. Um, it, yeah, this diary is fantastic. He talks about as they near the edge of the water, they spread out. Other craft had grounded further along the beach, and he was now abreast of them. They were disembarking with all types of material about their person, just as helpless as himself to shoot back at the beach defenders. Some of the boys, he says, some of the boys go down at the water's edge for a breather, but they come under fire, direct machine gun fire, which cr which crisscrosses the whole beach. Thank heaven. I do the right thing in mustering every inch of energy and setting off to run up the beach as fast as my heavy feet will plow across the sodden stand. Um, how its resistance torments me. Yeah, imagine running in sand is not easy. That imagine doing that carting loads of military gear and getting shot at. It's incredible what those young men went through. Uh, I see a sand mound slightly just ahead as I'm about all in. I make a super, super effort and leap clumsily behind it. I mean, his diary goes on, he talks about how the beach is strewn with casualties, especially on his left. The firing had become denser. He sees an 88 millimeter artillery gun open up on one of the flail tanks, those famous Hobart funny designs that were used to sweeping mines as it thundered up the beach. The first shot missed its target, hits the beach 20 yards from the company, diminishing, diminishing the company's personnel still more. The second shot didn't miss its target. He says, I know I swore aloud for them to get off the beach, which is now becoming an inferno. I've got the scares a bit bad now. Never in the whole African and Sicilian skirmishes have I been so scared as I am now. Um, and yeah, he, he goes on to talk. I couldn't find the time to be terrified. The adrenaline takes over. He ends up following a, a white guide tape through the minefield. He said he was very scared of minefields before this, but the adrenaline takes over. My terror for mines has forsaken me. I charge over the mines, full of confidence in making it to the other side without mishap. How I'm staring at the far fence now. I've started to come out of the minefield. To have won some, to have won some world championship in sport couldn't have given me more satisfaction as I step out. So yeah, just wanted to remind you that if you're interested in the Second World War and first-hand accounts, or first-hand accounts from anything, search the newspapers. There are loads of them in there. Um, yeah, on your, on your waiting on my World War One, World War Two book to be released. I, yeah, I should probably write one. Um, but yeah, I'll be I'll be sparing a thought for all those brave fellas that didn't make it off the beach 77 years ago on Sunday. Um, and I urge you to you to do so too. Um, I love that epitaph, John Mac Maxwell Edwards. For our tomorrow, they gave our today. Incredible sacrifices, brave, brave, brave men. Um, but yeah. <coughs> oh, Patricia Clues, my husband's uncle drove a landing craft on D-Day. He was just 18. Wow, it kind of reminds me, you know, oh, the, the youth 
um, of these guys and the incredible bravery. It's incredible. But yeah, uh, it's bang on five o'clock. I'm going to have to leave you. Thank you very, very much to everybody who has. Um, oh, Niall's already published the blog, uh, and you can read about it here. If you if you enjoyed those, uh, oh, that it's, it's that's the blog about my. Uh, that's the blog about the D Day Diaries, um, and there's also um, a blog about my trip with my grandfather to Normandy. So visit the Find My Past blog and take a look. Um, thanks very much for everyone who's tuning in. Thank you for everyone who submitted question of the weeks. Thank you to people who've been submitting tips. I've seen a few people doing that. Your heroes. That's why I love our community. Um, this has been great fun. I'm going to bid you all a very fond farewell. Um, I will see you again in the not too distant future. Happy have a have a wonderful weekend. Stay connected. Stay safe. Stay researching, and I will speak to you soon. Bye bye.